2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. Everybody, this is your DFS Army Bold Calls edition for January 8th, 2019. And boy, do we have a special surprise for you today. Joining myself, as always, is Mr. Bear out in Sunnyside, California. And a special guest, Denver Nuggets beat writer for the Mile High. And I lost that one. <laughs> <laughs> just mile high sports no mile the, high not sports. that important quite yet <laughs> yeah mile high sports is tj mcbride uh you follow him on twitter we love him and uh man it's uh it's special to have you on today tj how you doing I'm doing well. I appreciate you guys reaching out to me. I know it took me a second to get back to you. I didn't realize that somehow Twitter had forced me to unfollow you guys, but here we are. I made it back in time. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a special thing after my own heart when uh, I get uh, somebody from, you know, Colorado up there. We were talking a little bit before the show about uh, baseball and everything like that. But, uh, man, we've got uh, we're, we're definitely going to get into some uh, regular DFS for everybody else after TJ uh, uh, does his little thing here with us. But we want to talk uh, specifically some nuggets information and stuff right now. Um, Bear, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away, and then we'll kind of go as we do from there. Yeah, so so first of all, uh, last night was certainly high scoring, uh, <laughs> certainly a torrid pace for both teams. Yes. Uh, nothing new for Houston, uh, and nothing that new for Denver, but definitely a pace up game for Denver. So I noticed, well, we all noticed, uh, Millsap and Gary Harris both have been inserted back into the starting lineup. Walk us through, if you can, kind of what some of the thought process was there in terms of obviously what they bring to the starting lineup, what that does for those guys that are now going back to their reserve role. How does that kind of impact the bench? And then uh, also, if you can talk to us a little bit about some of the defensive principles that Coach Malone has been implementing this year that has shown the Nuggets to be really a top-tier defensive team compared to last season. Yeah, so to start with the rotational conversation, the Nuggets, when they had everybody injured, it was really just, we just need bodies to fill in the gap. So the bench unit became just chaotic at that point. And the only reason it really stayed above water was because Monte Morris has just been such a steady, he really is the balancing act for that bench unit. He really gets guys involved when they need him to be, knows when guys are hot, is able to get them the ball in the right position. So the bench unit was able to stay above water. But now, like you said, that Gary Harris and Paul Millsap have been reintegrated into the starting lineup, everything kind of just goes back to normalcy finally. Everybody knows that the Nuggets are going to get the most bench production out of Monte Morris, Mason Plumley, Malik Beasley, and some combination of Wancho Hernan Gomez and Torrey Craig. Uh, Trey Lyles has not been great this year, but he's been somewhat serviceable to fill in minutes for that backup power forward role. But now that the guys are healthy, things really are back to where they should be. When you look at the box score from the game last night, you wouldn't believe so. I mean, you would look at it and be like, Paul Millsap, six points, two of six shooting. Gary Harris, I think, was four of 11 from the field. It looks mm -hmm. like they may have struggled, but honestly, guys were just missing shots. It felt seamless. There wasn't any kind of push or pull trying to find the balance of reintegrating them into the starting lineup. So I thought, actually, they did pretty well of just stepping back into their original roles after being out for the better part of a month. So I do think things are being more normalized with this unit, and once you see shots start to fall, I think you're going to see guys bounce back, but that is, of course, if Gary Harris is healthy, because as we all saw, Gary Harris went down with the hamstring tweak last night after missing 11 games with a right hip injury. So 
the Nuggets have really been plagued by injuries in a way that I have not seen personally since I have been covering the NBA. There was a point where they were without seven players at on, on the court at any given time because they had so many injuries. I've never seen a team dig this deep before, and finally they get healthy and Gary Harris goes down that quickly. So we'll have to see and wait what happens with Gary. Um, but as of right now, the rotation is getting back to where it should be. And I would like to see Michael Malone actually shorten his rotation. I'm sure you guys have seen what I've seen where Trey Lyles has been ineffective largely the majority of the season yeah. um, you can't shoot 19% from three as a guy who relies on your three pointer to open up the rest of your game so when that is happening the Nuggets are going to have to shorten their rotation and if it was me I would be flat out eliminating Trey Lyles from this rotation entirely and giving Wancho Hernan Gomez those backup power forward minutes I'm not sure if Michael Malone agrees with that he has shown a ton of faith in Trey Lyles he has consistently said that an aggressive Trey Lyles is an effective Trey Lyles, so maybe he'll continue to ride with him, but it's looking more and more like as the Nuggets get healthy that Trey Lyles will be the one that takes a big hit to his minutes for the rest of the season. He just doesn't seem like he'll fit in the rotation anymore. What I, what I see what I see a lot about Trey versus, let's say, a Juancho, obviously Juancho's shot's falling significantly more than Lyles yes. from behind the arc, but what he what Lyles does that Hernan Gomez is not doing is he's actually he's getting to the rim. Um, obviously, if the three-point shot was falling and he can get more defenders to bite on that shot fake, he'll get a lot easier. But even though it hasn't been falling, he's still been getting to the rim, I'd say, pretty decently. Uh, but yeah, certainly he's been ineffective. Trey is a guy that when his shot's falling, everything opens up for yes. him and all of his teammates. And frankly, even on the defensive end, because once those shots are falling, the team gets back and they're ready to set up their defense. So there's a lot of stuff there um, that I think would help. C- can you talk us a little bit about is there any reason you saw Millsap playing 26 minutes last night? Was it because was it because of or 22 minutes? Excuse me. Was it because of tonight's game pre- preparation? Was it because he just wasn't hitting his shot? Because I see here he went two for six, so he wasn't that off. Yeah, I mean, Malone just threw in the towel in the last five minutes of the game. So when Paul Millsap would have finished and gotten to that 27, 28, 29 minute marker, he just wasn't in because the Nuggets had thrown in the towel at that point. And another interesting part of that conversation, it's funny that you bring that up. I believe Millsap's only averaging about 28 minutes a night throughout the entirety of the season so far. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's actually a, a stroke of brilliance by Michael Malone because they need the fullest extent of Paul Millsap to keep this defense at a dominant level like it was in November and in October. Um, it fell off in December. No one's going to argue that. I believe they were 24th in defensive efficiency in December, but they were without three starters. There's going to be a fall off, especially when you lose your two best defenders. But Michael Malone has tried to keep some gas in the tank for Paul Millsap at all times. It's almost like instead of running a car all the way to empty before filling it back up, he's filling it back up at a quarter tank. He's making sure yeah. that there's always some reserves left for him. And I think we're going to continue seeing that down the line, which is why he hasn't been as much of a DFS grab as many guys had hoped this season, even though he has been he's such a, a tailor-made fit for this team. Michael Malone just isn't playing him these minutes right now, and he's not he's gonna continue to do it that way. And with Paul Millsap coming off two of the worst injuries he's ever dealt with in his NBA career, it is yeah. not a bad decision, in my opinion. No, I would I would agree with you on that. Um can you talk a little bit about uh, we we've seen it a couple times this season so far um, the ineffective ability to to stay consistent with Nikola Jokic uh, running the offense through him he seems like he's more uh, he's been more pass uh, happy this year than you know in years past and it, it, I, I I turn back to the game I I think it was against Detroit where he took like one shot the whole game yeah it was um, Memphis. Memphis yes I know which okay. one you're talking about. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem like this is a guy that came out absolutely on fire. The offense was running through him. The ball movement was absolutely spectacular. The defense was still good. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like it just dropped off of a cliff. Is that more of what teams opposing teams are doing to him on the defensive end? And he's looking to keep his teammates involved? <laughs> Or is it just him not being aggressive and there's something else that we're not seeing on tape? The thing that everybody is not seeing, and myself included, I was in an argument with Matt Moore, HP Basketball on Twitter at the last Nuggets home game for the entirety of the game, is that Nikola Jokic is without a doubt an 
a, a unique one of a kind individual player. There is nobody who thinks like him. There's nobody who plays like him at his position. And because of that, we have no point of reference for what to expect from him on any given possession, any given quarter, any given game. So the way that I have kind the argument that we were having is is Nikola Jokic a supercomputer mathematician that just sees these things happening and knows when to assert himself? Or is he an artist that just kind of just goes with the flow and just feels it out and feels like shooting now and then feels like facilitating later? And I think it's the latter. I think Nikola Jokic is just a a sporadically, you know, his brain's all over the place artist when he's on the court, which is why he'll have 10 shots in the first quarter. He'll take only two in the set in the third quarter, but will for some reason have seven assists in that third quarter or whatever it is, because he goes just how he feels. So especially when you come to a DFS conversation about him, yes, he's been shooting a lot recently, but he could absolutely just take two shots tonight against Miami. That wouldn't surprise me at all, but he could also have 15 yeah. assists with that being said. So exactly. there is just no point of reference for him there is no idea what to expect because Nikola Jokic doesn't know what he's going to do until he steps on the floor he is not somebody who looks down a scouting report sees that he looks, he's going to be matched up against Clint Capella and knows that he has to get the better of him offensively to be able to win the game he just goes out there and is like oh wow my shot's falling. I'm going to keep shooting. Like, it is a completely mindless thing for him because it's all instinct. So it's so hard to quantify what the Nuggets need from him, what he's going to bring to the table. The only thing that is a complete factual statement is that Nikola Jokic will continually make the correct decision every single time he has the ball in his hands. Whether or not his teammates fulfill it or whether or not the execution is there is still right. to be determined, but he will always make that correct decision. Yeah, and, and we've been seeing that all season. And and I remember there was a phase where maybe it may have been three games consecutive. He just wasn't shooting. Like one yeah. of the games, he took one shot the entire game. And, I and remember, it was the last shot of the game. And it was the last shot of the game. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. That's the funniest part about that. And and I remember the focus from the coaching staff was, we need you to shoot. If, if we're going to win these games, we need you to be aggressive. But on the flip side of that, you mentioned something that I wanted to harp on. And that is specific to he'll make the right decision. Oftentimes what I see is he'll start the first quarter off aggressive because they're kind of daring him to shoot. They're kind of daring him to, to be to be the offensive guy, you know, taking away Jamal Murray, taking away Gary Harris, taking away Paul Millsap, Hernan Gomez, Tory Craig, whoever, whoever's on the court, Monty Morris, and kind of making Jokic because usually you're not looking at a center as the primary focal point of the offense. Well, that's how the Nuggets run their offense is through Nikola. And so – um, I see a lot of times within the first quarter, the opposition is kind of switching up their strategy. Okay, well, now we're going to take the ball out of his hands. And like you said, he still makes the right decisions. So from a DFS perspective, whether he's getting the ball in the paint or, or in the hole or not, he's still producing. He's still mm -hmm. getting rebounds. He's still getting assists. He still gets steals. He's got crafty hands. He still blocks shots. No, he doesn't jump through the roof, but he times his jumps yeah. pretty much to perfection. goes back to the artistry you talked about. Uh, that he has, and, and it's really it's his craft. So we've been huge Jokic fans all year long. Um, we're really happy to see him start to get a lot more aggressive on the offensive end because it raises his ceiling from, you know, 12 points, 15 assists to 30 points, 12 assists, 8 rebounds. Yeah. Um, that makes us, makes us really excited. He is just so talented in that way, too, because like you said, he'll start the first quarter out scoring at will, just does not worry about anything because he knows that he can dominate whatever matchup he has in that first quarter. And the second he becomes the person that every single defender on that floor is looking at, that's when the facilitation comes back. That's when all of a sudden he has these seven assist quarters, which he has done multiple times. And it's it's really is just incredible to watch. I've watched him play live for four and a half years now, and I still am just dumbfounded watching him play basketball. There's just no one like him. And it's funny because I don't think we really have even come close to seeing his ceiling yet. Oh, we're not even remotely there yet. That's and the I, thing that keeps yeah. stunning me is that we're not even close. Yeah, and I don't think he's really coming to his own in terms of knowing kind of where he'll go either. Because he's got, to me, he's got at least three more levels of where he's going to improve. Um, a lot of that is understanding from the very beginning of the game, this is our game plan, this is how we're going into the game, and kind of keep into that game plan. I kind of feel like... Listen, in the NBA, you've got to adjust and let the de let the defense kind of come to you and, and react to the defense, 100%. But you also stick to the game plan. I feel like he still has a level of game plan that he, he still needs to stick to. He will. He'll get there. He's still really, really young. And yeah, that's he's what, 23. People forget he's that. 23. People forget that. Exactly. At 23, I was in bars drinking, chasing skirts. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, I think 
Um, he's certainly improved his three point shot. I think once he's able to get that shot released a tad quicker, uh, the form is there. The range is there. Yeah. He can do that. Once he's able to get that shot off a little quicker and that becomes part of his arsenal consistently, we're going to see yet a, another level of stealing that we probably haven't seen so far. So we're, we're excited about his future too. An interesting part of the ceiling conversation, too, is that Nikola Jokic has no idea that he's good at basketball. Like, when you talk to him in the locker room, he's like, why are you guys talking to me? Like, why do you want to have a conversation with me? And he does not oh, understand hilarious. how great he is. And I think talking about how we don't know his ceiling yet, there could be a moment in time where he suddenly is like, oh, wait. I can take off the dribble step back threes and hit them consistently. Oh, wait. Like, I yeah. can go score 50 in a game if I want to. Like, I think that... Nikola Jokic could average a triple-double in a season if he wanted to. I think he could lead his team in points, rebounds, assists, and steals in a season. I think he can be an MVP candidate, and I think he can be a first-team All-NBA center at some point in his career. That is the ceiling that he has. It's just, is he ever going to realize that he is actually that good and put forth the effort to become that great? We'll see if he does, but if this is all he is for the rest of his career, he is going to go down as one of the best passing big men to ever grace a basketball floor. 100%. One of the most incredibly, um, you know, his basketball IQ is unquantifiable and a guy who has just been absolutely spectacular to watch. One of the most fun players in the league. And that's if nothing changes after just four years in the NBA being 23 years old. Yeah. So before I, we before I we continue and we're going to talk a little bit about tonight's game with you, TJ, before, before I let you jet, because I know you got to done the thing you got to get to the probably nicest play, most enjoyable play I've watched over the past. I've been watching NBA since I was a kid, man. So for a really long time, um, last year, to get into the playoffs, Jokic on the baseline, the one-handed sidearm pass cross-court to Gary Harris, who nailed the three. The shot was amazing, the catch, but that pass, I don't – I've never seen anything like it. Not from a center, yet alone, you know, anyone in the league. And I, that's a shot that will for, – or a pass that will forever be ingrained in my brain. I have like 15 of those, man. And every single one of them is as dumbfounding as the next. I mean, it's spectacular. The behind the back feeds when getting doubled, the over the head, no look passes when getting triple teamed. Like yeah. the dude just has this feel that is just, it's unquantifiable and it's absolutely spectacular. Yep. So tonight, so it looks like Gary Harris is questionable because of the mm -hmm. hamstring. Do you have any sort of inclinations one side or the other, whether he's going to play or not? Uh, personally, I have no actual inside information. If I'm going to speculate, I'm at the point where they have been already extremely conservative with Gary Harris. He could have come back a couple games earlier than he did after his ankle or after his hip injury. So yeah. they're going to be extremely conservative. So if it was me, I do not see them playing Gary tonight. I, 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 why push it on a back to back after flying with your, you know, with having that hamstring hurting in the air with the pressures changing? There's so many things that hurt you when you're traveling and playing a back to back beyond on just the actual rigors of an NBA game that Absolutely. I don't see them playing him tonight. So are we looking at Hernan Gomez coming back into the start? Yeah, lineup? I think you'll see Torrey Craig and Hernan Gomez in at the two and three spots for sure. Because I mean, those are the two who have been starting with Will Barton and Gary Harris out for the majority of the season anyway. So right. they're comfortable in that role. They're comfortable alongside Nikola Jokic. They're comfortable alongside Jamal Murray. So you might as well keep that going along, in my opinion. Can we talk and, a little bit about – sorry, Bear, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll finish. I was going to say, can we talk a little bit about the um, relationship between Monty Morris and Jamal Murray when they're on the court together? Uh, we've been noticing, and we've, we noticed this early on when they tried to start uh, Morris a little bit. He's more of a natural one, mm -hmm. moving Murray to the two. Um, but it, it seems like with Jamal Murray, it's all about whether or not his shot's falling. Um, yeah. It, it's, he's still learning, and... The, the easiest comparison that I have is comparing Jamal Murray to a younger Russell Westbrook learning to play the point guard position coming out of college because Russ was a two guard at UCLA mm -hmm. and Scott Brooks made him that ball handling aggressive point guard. And that's kind of what I see with Jamal Murray. He's learning how to become a better passer and keep his teammates involved, but he can get hot and score with anybody with the best of them. Oh, but, absolutely. But the relationship between these two and and Murray learning to play off the ball with Jokic on the court, with uh, Monty Morris on the court, 
how is that progressing? And is it something that we think is going to be a continuous part of the rotation going forward, even when Will Barton and Gary Harris are back in the rotation more consistently? So there's a lot to unpack here. So I'm sorry if I rant a little bit too much here. But no, going back to before Summer League. So this is before Monte Morris had gotten his NBA contract. This is before he had shown the world that he can be this backup point guard. It was actually Jamal Murray and Monte Morris who played more pickup basketball together than anybody else on this team. So Monte Morris and Jamal Murray have developed a chemistry going back from the second the season ended last year up until now. So their chemistry together is very real. What you guys have seen on the floor is absolutely correct. They do know how to play off each other and Jamal Murray um, I, the Russell Westbrook thing is interesting because I think that they both start from very different foundational points as players. Russell Westbrook was a downhill, explosive, athletic slasher who could just obliterate anybody at the rim, had the creativity and the touch at the rim to use that athleticism. Jamal Murray only gets into the paint because his three-point shot is so lethal and so terrifying for defenses to give up. So when you guys have guys closing out so aggressively to him, that's when he can get downhill and he's had a couple, a couple, a couple poster dunks and a couple creative finishes, but like you said before, everything starts from his jump shot. If his jumper does not fall, guys can just go under screens. He'll continue to miss. He won't be able to get into the paint. He's not as creative as a, of a ball handler to be able to break down a defense one-on-one -on -one without a screen. He's not a he doesn't have great enough vision to create for his teammates when the offense breaks down. So he doesn't have those traits yet. He has been developing them. It's it's disingenuous to say that he has not improved, but he's still very far away from being a legitimate him an NBA point guard in my opinion he still has issues with guys like well everybody struggles with Patrick Beverly but even <laughs> like Eric Bledsoe guys who are just wanting to play physical into you for Strappy, 94 right? feet yeah and when if you have anybody who's willing to be physical with them he's going to turn the ball over he just hasn't learned to deal with that level of on-ball pressure yet unless his name so, is Lonzo Ball and yeah, and then he'll dribble around him in a circle a couple of times or something like that and just, you know, sprinkle a little chaos on top of the mixture. But he's still learning that role. And that's why him being alongside Nikola Jokic has been so important to him, because you have the best passing center of all time, potentially standing next to you, who can dribble the ball up the floor and literally play as a point center. When I talk about Jamal Murray ceiling, I always ask the question, if he was on the magic as opposed to the nuggets, is he anywhere near this level of production? And I think the the answer is no. I don't think that he has enough skills beyond just the lights out shooting to be able to be a guy who can come in and just be the primary option and handle an offense. With Nikola Jokic, though, there's enough gravity around him on the floor to give him just enough space to be that much more functional as a point guard. He has tremendous ceiling and it would be unfair to say that he couldn't reach that he could be a 25 point per game scorer in this league at some point that is not out of the question at all but as a point guard right now he still has a lot to learn in my opinion cool. uh do we have a eta on possibly i know will barton's been practicing with the team um do we have a idea of maybe when we're going to be able to see them both are him back on the court yet or they are I know you keep no. saying that they're taking it slow but we keep hearing that he's close and hearing that he's close I mean we're gonna see him before the all-star break right I would be stunned if we didn't. Uh, Michael Malone did, though, backtrack his comments before the game yesterday saying that it could be a couple weeks until we see Will Barton. Oh. Um, his original time frame was looking about eight weeks and we're approaching 12 weeks as of right now what i can say is that i have not heard of any setback of any kind i have not heard of him struggling on the floor in any kind i've heard he's been fine i think what this is is that will barton told me that He's never been injured as a basketball player, not in the NBA, but going all the way back to playing street ball in the streets of Baltimore. Like he has just never been injured. The longest he's ever sat out from playing basketball since he was a child was two weeks. He's never had surgery before. He's never had a serious injury before. And he has to figure out how his body is going to respond to an increased workload after being surgically repaired. Mentally, yeah. that's a hard thing to overcome for a yeah. lot of guys. So yeah. I think... He, I, I, the way that I have been told by people in the Nuggets front office and around the team is that if this Miami game tonight was a playoff game, he would be playing. Okay. 
that's the way that I have seen it. That's, that's why I've had it explained to me. But that also could mean he could miss the next two weeks to get him from 90% healthy to 100% healthy. So we'll have to just wait and see. But he is on his way back. He is looking good and he is improving. But like I've said a bunch, they're just being unbelievably conservative with him. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Bear, anything closing final thoughts? We need to let TJ go here. I know he's got a radio spot. You're good. I got like 10 more minutes. So I don't know. Like, sprint out of here. Oh, okay. Never mind. I think the biggest difference with, with, with uh, Will Barton, uh, we refer to him as the thrill uh, yes. on the show, by the way. So uh, the biggest thing with the thrill is so when he did grow up playing ball on those streets of Baltimore, when he did play in high school, when he did play in college, they needed him on the floor. Like, yeah. he needed to play. Um, it wasn't an issue if he had a, a knee injury or a hip injury. or He's playing. It didn't matter. Uh, yeah, this, this is, this is a, a, a very cautious front office, a very conservative training staff, uh, some of the best in the, in, in the league uh, in that sense, to make sure they're not pushing anybody to rush fast because this is not about – this week it's not about this month it's not about now it's about when we do get to that playoff push they need will Mm -hmm. to be that leading scorer to lead that second unit no matter what and if he gets into the starting lineup great because now denver has significantly more depth than they had last year with beasley and morris and hernan gomez kind of stepping up into much more of a significant role Um, and then lyle's kind of even being that third option if they need him to be if he can get his shot to fall it's just a different ball game right now. So I, I I'm fa- I'm fond of the approach, the slow approach yeah. with Will. Uh, they're still winning games. They're still you know that's the big the thing top, up at the top of the of the Western Conference, which is the strongest conference we've seen in God knows how long. Now, if they were plummeting, okay, let's look at it a little bit differently. We're losing six games. We're losing seven games. We're losing whatever it might be. We need more of a scoring punch. Will, can you go? Yes, cool. Let's get you back on the court. But like you said, that's not the case. And so uh, you know. Uh, we certainly um, are happy to see that they're letting him get 100% versus 90%. Uh, one big thing, too, to hit on. I'm sorry if I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, ahead, will please. Barton will be the unquestioned starting small forward of this Denver Nuggets team once he is reintegrated into the starting lineup. He is, without a doubt, the guy who will start. And I think, for me, he is going to be, while well, Gary Harris and Paul Millsap and frankly, Jamal Murray may be better players than Will Barton. Will Barton is the second most important player to that starting lineup because he takes the ball handling duties away from Jamal Murray. He can take on more of a defensive role on the perimeter, so Gary Harris isn't the only guy who can play some defense. On top of that, he is a 38% three-point shooter like Wancho has been this year. You're literally getting a sprinkle of everybody and making them into one solid player who can alleviate all of the pressure from everybody else on that starting lineup by putting Will Barton in into there. So once he does get back, I do think you're going to see this Nuggets team just ascend rapidly. They could have a very quick seven, eight game winning streak kind of thing once he does get back because he fixes so many issues that they have in that starting group. So Murray, Harris, Thrill, Millsap, Jokic. That's it's starting five. Sounds like a damn contender to me. <laughs> That's Yes, it does. Especially oh. when you have Monte Morris, Mason Plumley, Malik Beasley, and Isaiah Thomas off the bench, potentially. like That's as deep of a team as you have in the NBA right there. So that's what I want to talk about next. I'm glad you brought it up. So, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles. I've been a, <laughs> a diehard Lakers fan my entire life. Um, you know, now that I cover the NBA, obviously I'm, I'm much broader. Um, yes. But yeah, we, we did have, uh, you know, partial season uh, last year with, with Isaiah Thomas and some of the things that we noticed, um, defensive inefficiencies are of course. blaring. Yes. Um, and you really need to um, system, if you will, the defense with whatever unit he's running to make sure you hide those inefficiencies or you'll get burned every single time. Um, we all know what he can do on offense. He's, he can shoot the three. He can shoot the mid-range. He can handle the ball. He can make plays. He can get to the basket. Even though he's short from an NBA perspective, um, he gets into the paint. He still, he still gets to the rim and gets to the, sh- gets to the basket. Um, so those things are all great. H- how do you envision – first of all, he's probably not going to be back until after the All-Star break, I would imagine. Yeah, at this point, who knows? But, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's about what I'm looking at, too. So, so let's say, you know, uh, March time frame – um, when he does come back, though, he's how how do you envision Denver 
implementing and clearly with the second unit, but how do you see him implementing him with their system? I honestly don't quite know. That's the only question that I'm wondering right now, and he's the only injured player that I'm worried about coming back and how he's going to fit in. If Michael Porter Jr. gets healthy, he's just not going to play. If Jared Vanderbilt gets healthy, he's just not going to play. Like There's just no room for these guys. Like It just is what it is. But Isaiah Thomas and Michael Malone have a very good relationship, so Malone is going to want to play his guy in some, re- in some degree. We don't know what that degree is going to be yet, but going back to their time in Sacramento, like they still have kept a good relationship going throughout all these years the other thing is that you cannot take monte morris out of this rotation no, you goodness. absolutely cannot it is not something that is on the table from what i understand he has been too good this year has filled too many gaps and has uh, elevated their bench unit to such heights that they do not want to move his minutes at all he'll play 18 to 20 minutes a night for the rest of the year i would assume um So once you get into the conversation of that is, do you really want to just be a a bad defensive bench unit and potentially outscore every bench unit in existence? If Isaiah Thomas is good enough to do that, which he can play off ball. We've all seen him play off ball before, even at his peak. He can do that. And if he is able to do that, you start asking the question, who gets axed out of that rotation? Because... If you do have Isaiah, Monte Morris, and Mason Plumlee off the bench, that's an eight-man rotation right there. And that's the leaves Monte Morris, Juancho Hernan Gomez, Trey Lyles, and Malik Beasley off the bench, and Torrey Craig. I I can't remember if I said his name. So I do think that the Nuggets are going to have to make a decision that they're going to cut one of Torrey Craig, Malik Beasley, Juancho Hernan Gomez, or Trey Lyles entirely from the rotation, more likely two of them. And that last person left is just the 10th guy that maybe gets six minutes a night so is isaiah thomas going to outpace malik beasley is isaiah thomas going to outpace wancho if he can't do that the nuggets can't play him and that's just the end of the conversation because they can't play 11 deep they honestly shouldn't play 10 deep and if isaiah can't bring what those guys are bringing to the table he might just not play i see it kind of starting out like a situation like the rockets are doing with brandon knight right now yeah Um, working him in you know because it's been a while I mean, this is this is a guy that, you know, he's played, what, 40 games in the last two and a half seasons. Um, yeah, we're talking 18 months since he's played a basketball game. Yeah, wow. so you've got, you know, work him in uh, slowly, maybe take a, a couple minutes from, you know, each guy, and then hopefully you can have him built up to around 19, 20 minutes by the time the playoffs roll around. Um, and maybe if there's a couple games in there, you know, you've got, uh, you've got your seating wrapped up. Um, that you can kind of stretch them into that 23-24 mark. Um, I, I wanted to ask one last question here, and it has to do with the Western Conference as a whole. Okay. Um, we've seen a lot of really, really kind of shocking instances and kind of happen. Uh, this feels like the first year where Golden State actually has chinks in their armor. Uh, more consistently, not like just an off night here and an off night there. Like it's it's been a struggle for them. Yeah. More consistently throughout the season, Oklahoma City we know is one of the best defensive teams in the NBA right now. Paul George is playing at what I we've had this conversation. What I think is actually an MVP type level. Um, I agree. You've got Houston that's playing unbelievable right now, even without Chris Paul. Uh, I mean, the Clippers are there, San Antonio. This conference from top to bottom, and we know what's going to happen when LeBron comes back to the Lakers. Do you envision where this is going to come down to like the last weekend where 90% of the, of the teams in the Western Conference all the way down to probably, you could say the Pelicans, Minnesota, Dallas type area yeah. are fighting for seeding? Yes, I do. I mean, you only have, what, three and a half games separating the eighth-seeded Lakers from the 14th-seeded Mavericks? Like, when there's only that many games from the very bottom of the Western Conference um, for, the, for the playoff seeding all the way up to the eighth seed, there's going to be battles. And the other thing that no one's talked about, and I don't know why, is the the lottery odds have been skewed this year. You don't get much, nearly as much for tanking and becoming one of the worst teams in basketball. So I don't know why Dallas and the and the Memphis Grizzlies wouldn't fight to make the playoffs. I don't see those teams between you know seeds eleven and fourteen trying to tank for good lottery position in the Western Conference. They're going to continue playing every single night. 
fighting for that eighth seed. So I think that you are going to see basically seeds one through 14 in complete flux from here until the end of the season in April because they're just that close. I mean, one and a half games separate seeds one through three. Then you have two games separating seeds four through eight. Then you have just two games separating seeds nine through 14. Like there's going to be a lot of chaos and that is not enough separation to where I envision a team separating themselves enough that somebody may decide to tank out of that race. I think we're going to see 14 Western Conference teams fighting for the playoffs this year. Yeah, yeah I mean, Memphis, all the way down to Memphis, who's kind of fallen off. They're, they're in it. Yep. Um, do you think that, like, what do you think is, do you think anything interesting is going to happen in the Western Conference as far as the trade deadlines, buyout <laughs> candidates, anything like that, that we need to kind of watch out for? Um, I, I've been running this through my head trying to figure out who is going to get Bradley Beal. Because Bradley Beal is the one guy in Washington who is going to be worth what he is actually playing as. The trade kicker with John Wallace to extreme, plus he is hurt now and out for the rest of the year. Otto Porter's contract is always going to be an overpay, even though he is a very good player. I don't want this to sound like Otto Porter is a bad player. He's just never going to be a max guy. So if they want to salvage any of this... Bradley Beal is the guy. So if New Orleans can make a deal to get a Bradley Beal, somehow Dell Demp swings that. And let's be honest here, the Wizards organization is not exactly the most competent in the world. So there is a chance here for a complete, just ridiculous kind of a trade that comes out of this scenario. But let's say that New Orleans can get a guy like Bradley Beal to play with, to you know, pair with Drew Holiday um, and Anthony Davis. That immediately puts them back in the conversation for home court advantage. What if the what if the Lakers can get a guy like Bradley Beal? What if Utah can get a guy like Bradley Beal? Imagine oh, wow. Bradley Beal and Donovan Mitchell in a backcourt together without Ricky Rubio's offensive spacing just killing their offense. Like, mm. you have teams that they are one player away from going from the 10th seed to the 3th seed. And I want to see which team is the one willing to go get a guy like Bradley Beal because there's nobody that you can just drop onto a roster and help these guys like Bradley Beal can do on any team. So I want to see who can try and you know get Bradley Beal out of the hands of the Wizards. This is how I know that TJ is my spirit animal because because <laughs> because Keith Keith knows I've been talking about Beal coming to the Western Conference Since probably November. for the yeah I mean it's just been nonstop I've been saying it I've been saying it I've been saying it. go get him go get him go get him Washington is going to t- take something that they probably shouldn't to start over because again they don't have Wall now um, he's going to be out for the season. I, I mean, they sh- they have to start over at some point. And if that means getting some young players, if that means getting some draft picks and young players for someone like Beal, I don't see why they wouldn't do it. And how many times do we see a healthy Beal and Wall get into the playoffs and just not be able to have any success in the Eastern Conference? No less. Yes. I mean, it's not like they're in the West. So uh, I'm I'm expecting it. We could all agree, though, that Beal without Wall is a very different animal than Beal with Wall, right? Like, that is just a completely separate entity at that point. So let me ask you guys this from a Denver Nuggets point of view. Would you build a trade package around Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., and a pick, and then salary filler to go get a guy like Bradley Beal? I'm not saying I would or that I've even heard of it. I'm just genuinely curious. Um, No. I would not at this point because you got to where you are with this group, I think if you're talking about moving forward into the next summer, then possibly. But you're the you're the one seed in the Western Conference. Um, I go I go to battle with my guys. I don't yeah. think Denver really, honestly, should do anything. Just like I don't think Oklahoma City, other than maybe solidifying a veteran bench presence uh, to kind of help uh, Dennis Schroeder out, should do hardly anything at all. Um, I mean, interesting. It, it's it's just one of those things. Like, I'm a big thing of uh, about team chemistry, which is why one of the reasons I think that Washington absolutely just plummeted this year is yeah. they don't like each other. Uh, yeah. So I would not do that during the season. Now, if you want to entertain that thought going into next season uh, over the summer, then sure, you, we can entertain that thought, and that's that's a definite question that you should probably ask. Uh, because of Beal's uh, abilities. But I don't think that midseason, for somebody like the Denver Nuggets, the way that they're playing right now, you throw that kind of monkey wrench in. Because we've seen teams add players, and it takes six to eight weeks to 
feel comfortable playing on the yeah. court together with the spacing again. And I don't think you can afford that going into the playoffs in the Western Conference. How old is Jamal Murray, TJ? Jamal Murray is 21 years old, turning 22 soon. Bradley Beal is 25 years old. Yes. He's 25. He's still, he hasn't even reached his prime, frankly. Yep. So for me, my answer is different than Keith. My answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, mine's a, you, mine's a no-brainer yes for me too. You do that in a heartbeat. Number one, you're bringing a known commodity of a stud to the team. You're bringing one of the purest shooters that the game has. Uh, uh, you're bringing a guy that now Nikola Jokic can work off of, and and or he can work off of Nikola, but Nikola has another mm. dead-on shooter to pass the ball to out of the post. He's elevated defensively. Um, you can actually now finally move Monty Morris to that point guard role and have Beal be a shooting guard that he is. Uh, you can even move Harris to the to the three if you wanted to. So, I mean, for me, there's it's not even a question. And that will so what that trade will do again. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not. This is all speculatory. Yes, yeah, spe- speculation wise, if that was something to be that they'll be able to pull off, that would not put them in the top three in terms of title odds, in my opinion. Yeah. Whereas right now they're probably what fifth. Yeah, I would say sixth. so. They'll they'll elevate them two three spots. Yeah. Before I jet, cause I got a jet here pretty soon. The one thing about Bradley Beal is that is Jamal Murray ever actually going to become a better player than Bradley Beal is right now? And the question for me is that that's a very I, I don't know yet. I don't think he will. I think that they could get as good of each other, but you already have that guy in Beal. So I'm there personally, but I think it's an interesting conversation. So it's one that I definitely wanted to throw out to you guys real quick. Oh, yeah. No, I appreciate you doing that. We we love it, and I I'm I'm really excited to see what Michael Porter Jr. does. I mean I I mean I yeah. was a big fan of his in college. Uh, I I saw him play. I was kind of blown away that he went so low. I know it was an injury, but you guys kind of got a steal for a guy that you didn't really need him to play now. So you were able to take that risk. It it's I'm not comparing the players, but it's a similar situation to Golden State. Like Golden State was like, yeah, we'll take on Cousins. We don't need you to play now. Other yeah. teams were like, ah, if I'm gonna pay you, I need you to play now, and we gotta you know compete the Warriors like we're already the best if you can come and you can play in March I'm Ooh. fine with that that's just you know icing on the cake kind of thing um, and it's similar to, to the draft where you know teams that didn't absolutely have to have this high pick play he would have gone top five yeah he would have he's that talented this is a guy who could average 28 in a game like that's how yeah. good he is yeah. but yeah. the one thing is that I think that it's the best thing possible that he came to Denver because he is forced to sit there not think he's Kobe Bryant and allow himself to see how things operate on a selfish right. egalitarian offense because if he would have came in healthy this year and tried to incorporate himself into this team he could have been a guy that was on the outside looking in in the way of the you know the play style that he plays with so I think him sitting out and being forced to watch the way NBA basketball is played could be the best possible thing for him. Agreed. Yep, Super I agree. helpful. I wish more. I wish more rookies would be able to do that. I think we're going to see more and more of it happening because guys are willing to take risks on guys who are injured because the medical side of things is just improving so quickly. I think we're going to see more and more and more of that. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, to to come in and ask, especially right now with you know we're drafting nineteen year old rookies that have been basically the focal point of all the offenses up through AAU ball, you know, to ask them to be the savior of a franchise, you know, after, uh, you know, how many, who, who knows how many years of, of being bad is, it, it's a lot to put on a kid. You know, they haven't really mm-hmm. learned exactly how to play basketball yet. They just know they have this God-given athletic ability that they could just go out and dominate. And you can't do that at the NBA level. So go look at look at Emmanuel Moutier's time in Denver. Yep. Came in, handed him the keys, and everything fell apart. Like it just Absolutely. is what it is, unfortunately. So Absolutely. All right, TJ. Good luck to you, brother. Appreciate it. I appreciate you, you guys. Do this more. Hey, I'm always around, man. I know it took me a little while to get to you guys, but if I don't respond, just send me another one. You ain't gonna bother me. I'm fine. So <laughs> I'll right, around. Thank Thanks you for the time, brother. Much. Appreciate Have a good it. one. Happy New Year. Good you luck. too. Happy Take New it easy. All righty, guys. Uh want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in for that. We are going to start talking about some DFS basketball. That sounds like a plan, Bear. I'm in. Let's do it. All righty here. Oh, man, that was exciting. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to have him on. We've been wanting to do that for quite a while. And uh... Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, definitely, um, definitely a good guy. And uh, the fact that, you know, it, it's good to talk not only basketball from a, a basketball standpoint, but, you know, he actually kind of knows a little bit about what's going on in DFS. So uh, that was that was nice to do. So, um, all right, let's uh, uh, let me reset here. Uh, so I get everything going for my video this morning. Uh, just want to let everybody know um, we do have our pod, our uh, our promo code podcast 2019. You get 20 percent off uh, your first month. So um, we're going to be trying to get a lot more of these uh, team beat writers on. Um, we're going to be talking to obviously TJ McBride, uh, hopefully a lot throughout the rest of the course of the season as well. Um, and obviously you get us as well, uh, with that too, breaking it down. So it's not going to be an every day or every week type of thing, but, uh, we're going to try to work some more of these guys in, uh, that are going to be willing to come on. So if you enjoy it and you want to see more of our VIP tools, uh, and everything, make sure you sign up, um, for the DFS army, use promo code podcast, 2019, me and bear do get the credit for this, which is always, always awesome. And, uh, you're going to get 20% off your first month. So. Uh, let's start with the point guard position, shall we? Uh, <laughs> Russell Westbrook versus Minnesota. He is... Okay, so we talked a lot about his shooting woes, right? And over the last couple games, he's actually shot a lot better. I uh, talked about this, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, we talked about how he is uh, his mid-range jumper is starting to fall, and that kind of just opens everything up. He's being a little bit more aggressive as far as finishing at the hole or um, at the rim, uh, you know, the last couple games too. And, you know, he's, he's back up to around that 40% mark. Uh, and this has been the first time in uh, since the middle of December – and early part of December that he's actually had back-to-back -back games now where he shot at least 39% from the field. Um, he's not taking nearly as many three-point attempts, which is good. Uh, and he's getting to the free, th free throw line a lot more. Um, you know, 6-6, six, 10-6 six, uh, six in his last four. Okay? As opposed to the 2-3-4-2 two, two that he was getting to the middle of the month. I don't. I, I. I really actually do like this tonight. Um, the last time that he faced Minnesota, uh, you know, he went ten for nineteen from the field. That's fifty-two percent. He only shot one three-point attempt. Only took four free throws. This game was. Uh, we lost by two, but it was a weird game. Uh, Andrew Wiggins ended up going off, I believe, and it, it was just something that was that was really yeah. Andrew Wiggins went off. Um, that game was with. Yeah, it was. Uh, that game was without Jeff Teague, without Derrick Rose. Um, you know, <laughs> when Jared Bayless and Gorgie Jang are playing 16 and 20 minutes, you know you're shorthanded. Uh, and the Timberwolves always play us really, really tough. So if there's any worry about us blowing them out, which I we don't talk about enough, um, and we shouldn't, I'm not really worried about that tonight.
Um, so a couple things. Um, first of all, this is totally not DFS relevant, but it does kind of have a bearing. Um, so a couple, two nights, last night, last night, um, I saw um, Tobias Harris and Kemba Walker out having dinner together here in Los Angeles. And you didn't it was take a pictures? You didn't tell us? I did have pictures. Oh, you do? Uh huh. Oh, I didn't get any of those. Um, well, they were with my buddy, so oh. I'll send it, I'll send them to you though, either way. Right. But um, who, by the way, seem like really cool guys. But um, the point here is that I didn't know they were such good friends. Um, and guys, when NBA friends play against each other, it is no holds barred. They go out there and they give it their all. Um, I so uh, obviously it's not DFS related, right? But uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing about Kemba is guards, and you're going to sit there and you're going to say, "Well, but what about you know Patrick Beverly and Avery Bradley defense?" He's going to see mostly Gilgis Alexander um, to start the game. Now, if he starts to light it up, you're going to get Patrick Beverly on him. I'm not nearly as concerned with Kemba for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is going to be a, a really fantastic pace. Uh, I'm fond of the pace of this game. Second of all, uh, 230 and a half over under. Uh, I mean, someone's going to have to score for, the, for Charlotte. Uh, and I don't see it being, you know, <laughs> Nicholas Batum. Uh, we'll have to see if Lamb comes back or not. We'll, we'll, we'll monitor that news. Um, but... For me, I think Kemba is going to lead lead the offensive charge for this for this team in this game. And guess what? He's under nine K again. Finally, he's eighty nine hundred on FanDuel. No brainer for me. Um, I'm I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum with you, uh, and it's all going to be whether or not we see Jeremy Lamb in the lineup or not. Um, and I, I'm just looking at it here. When it, it's, I don't know how to really explain it, but it, it's, it doesn't seem like it's a spacing thing. It seems like it's more of a, a attention to de- detail or attention to the defense type of thing. Um, you know, Kemba really has not looked good since, Jeremy Lamb left the lineup. Um, I mean, so he's had points of 22, 22, 34. Uh, oops. Um, I'm trying to look and find out when the last time that Kemba was in the lineup or Jeremy Lamb. Okay, so the last game that Jeremy Lamb was in the lineup was the Orlando Magic game, and he played nine minutes and left. Uh, Kemba scored 35 fantasy points. Uh, He shot, what was it, Uh, 62% from the field, took 16 shots. Uh, Now, that game was a blowout, so he didn't have to do a lot. I'll give you that. Um, If you look at... You know, he's he's taking the shots. He's hitting his, you know, his true shooting percentages were up in all of those, all of those, uh, those games. And then all of a sudden you look at it and Jeremy Lamb leaves the lineup and you've got games where he's got, you know, 28%, 35%, 45%. That's inefficient by yeah. Kemba Walker, Kemba Walker yeah. standards. Yeah. Um, there might be a little something to this. I mean, this is a guy that hadn't scored outside of that game where he got, you know, against the Lakers, um, where they just got absolutely blown out of the gym. You know, he played 25 minutes and shot horrible. Okay? Yeah. He doesn't put up games in the 22s to 35s very often, and definitely not consistently like that. 
And the only thing that I can see is it's a it that's when Jeremy Lamb left out because you're Dallas isn't a good defensive team. Phoenix isn't a good defensive team. Now Denver is, but you know, um, I don't know, man. It's it's one of those things that I'm a little I'm, I'm a little weary about. Yeah, he's he's definitely going to be GVP. I'm I'm not I'm not, you know in cash I'm playing Westbrook and I'm moving on, but. Uh, for tournaments, I think he's got the upside that I want. Uh, so that's, you know, and, and you're right. I think a lot of it is going to be dependent on Lamb. I, I don't know that Lamb is going to come back into into his normal 30-plus minutes uh, coming off of an injury. I mean, he missed a handful of games. He, he obviously was hurt. Um, so we'll have to see what happens. If Lamb comes back... I like it more because because Lamb is such an offensive threat that he opens up the floor for Kemba, um, and that's really where I think um, I think it benefits Kemba. So I'm looking for I'm, we'll, we'll look out for that news. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit. Do you think? Okay, first off, do you think that Kyle Lowry plays? I don't see any reason why they would play him. Yeah, I don't either. Um, Darren Fox against Phoenix. Okay, so we need to talk about this uh, a little bit here. Um, the Sacramento Kings had a Sherry Maw game. Mm-hmm. Um, it is only a score of eight, but it, it is still one of those games. Now, yeah. this yeah. is their previous schedule. Let's go. Um, let's go back to just after Christmas at the Clippers. Mm-hmm. Not really that bad. L.A. Lakers, then home, or, sorry, at the Clippers, then home for the Lakers, then at the Lakers. So they went to and from Sacramento to L.A. Uh, three times. Uh, then two, then home for Portland, Denver, Golden State, Orlando. Okay, now they're going to Phoenix. Um, the starters did not play a ton last night. Hard, uh, only Bogdanovich was the only one that, that even saw 30 minutes. Yeah. And Carly that, Stein played 18. Yeah. Fox played 23. Buddy played 25. Bielita played 22. Um, I, I don't – normally we just avoid the Sherry Ma games, and we will when we're talk, we'll talk about some of these Denver guys. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more too. I don't know if I can completely avoid them against – now, now here, I guess here's my thing. If Devin Booker doesn't play, that's the kicker right there. I think I'm going to be completely off of him. That's the kicker right there. Well, I'm not completely off of him. I'm, you know, I'm playing like Mason Jr. and you know, Justin Jackson. Like, I, like, if that case, I'm going to start to play some of the minimum priced guys if Booker sits because. You know, this this Kings team is not what we've been accustomed to the last several years. They're they're a legitimate team. They're a legitimate threat. They they can beat any team on any given night. Um, and so, if and by the way, excuse me. Um, Devin Booker is closer to doubtful. Yeah, so. I, I just saw that. So, uh, you know, look at it as though he's not going to play. Because if, if you get downgraded to doubtful, chances are you're, you're not going to play. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's looking like it's, uh, it's not a good situation. So maybe, maybe we just end up avoiding him for a completely different reason. Because, like, yeah, they blew out Orlando last night, but. I, the same thing is gonna happen tonight, more likely than not. I mean, mm-hmm. you tell mm-hmm. me, Kevin or Kelly Oubre is gonna keep him in the game. Um, now there, there's some there some good matchups here and stuff like that. So maybe completely avoiding him, is, but make sure that you're cognizant of how many of these guys that you're putting in this game. Um, like normally we don't predict blowouts, but with Devin Booker being the best player on the Phoenix Suns, it's I mean. Don't go loading up on De'Aaron Fox at 8,200 right, as a core right. play, knowing that this is a for real possibility that, you know, Booker sits and they get just blown out of the gym. 
Um, make you can have some exposure. Just don't make him a don't make these guys core plays, guys. Um, uh, with that said, I, I do have a little bit of interest in DeAnthony Melton, uh, just because he's so cheap. Um, you know, okay, so we didn't ask we didn't ask TJ about Jamal Murray's ankles. Um, <laughs> I forgot to do that. Yeah, we forgot to do that. <laughs> oh, but, man. Um, you know, Denver, they're on a Sherry Ma game as well. Uh, you know, back end of a back-to-back, traveling. It's just, it's not a good situation for Denver here. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to have a lot of Denver exposure. Uh, I will probably in tournaments have some Wancho, uh, some Monty Morse, some of these backup guys that are going to see extra run. Uh, possibly yeah. if these minutes are limited. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know if I can play Jamal Murray tonight at 7,600. I'm not. So, uh, you know, uh, these are the these are the two games that I'm going to um, look for the value place because, you know, I'm playing that card. So I'm with you. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that you know we're we're trying to really be cognizant of. Um, I don't like this position today. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Like, what do you mean? Oh, you mean point guard in general? You mean? Yeah, like gotcha. some Ben Simmons. I've got some interest in uh, Steph Curry. I've got some interest in, but like I don't have a lot of like. I'm not sold on anybody outside of, you know, Russ. Like, and even then, I'm not really sold on him because of the price because we know that he could only go for 50. So, like, I don't think that I'm going to have a core point guard play today. Um, that's tough because you're going to have to. So, <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to. I, I don't have, gonna to have, have a core point guard play. I, I mean, I'm gonna have somebody in cash, obviously. Yeah, but, yeah. Like, yeah. So, I'm with you on Melton, by the way. I do like Melton a lot. Um, Jeremy Lamb just said he's gonna play today, so I'm even higher on Kemba now. Um, but yeah, I mean, Melton and Russ for me in cash are perfect. Um, any interest in maybe like a, a Darren Collison? I mean, these these guards for Indiana are both questionable. Um, you know, unless something's come down in the last hour. Darren Collison, Corey Joseph, they're both questionable. If one yeah. of them sits, I have interest in the other. If not, then it becomes a Victor Oladipo, maybe a uh, Aaron Holiday type of game. Um, I, I don't know. Like I said, it's just... It really, really is one of those things, like, I'm not sure I'm in love with anybody at the position. Yeah. So, uh, all right, let's talk about shooting guards. Uh, unbeknownst to a lot of these other guys, um, you know, if Devin Booker doesn't play, it, that doesn't matter to me. Um, depending on what happens with the indie guards, it, my love for Victor Oladipo is either going to go up or down at 9,200. Yeah. If Bradley, like, I've got Bradley Beal slotted in there right now as the top, but if both of these guards miss for Indy, then Victor Oladipo becomes the top player over Bradley Beal just because of price. Well, I can't play Beal. Not, uh, not even in cash? I'll tell you why. Jimmy Butler's probable. Ah, uh, yes. It's going to be <clears throat> everyone else but Beal is going to have to beat them. Out of Porter... Um, Sadoransky, Thomas Bryant, who's got his hands full with Embiid. Uh, it's going to have to be everyone but because he's basically going to have Butler glued to him the entire game. So. Oh, man. Um,. So does that have a do, does that mean you have interest in Jimmy Butler on the other side? I don't. 
because when his his role is going to be slow down their best player, um, he just I haven't seen I haven't seen the ceiling from him outside of a game where maybe Embiid missed or whatever, but um, I haven't seen the ceiling from Butler with with Philly uh, when all three are on the court. So um, I, I do like the price, but I would rather pay a little bit less and play Clay Thompson against the Knicks, who he could go crazy and put up all of his threes and blow and you know and leads to the blowout. But he was the reason why they got there, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just there. I, I think there's better options than him. Uh, so yeah, as for me. Okay. Um... I think Clay Thompson and Buddy Heald, I, I'll have a little bit of exposure to Buddy just because he can get hot and go nuts. Uh, Clay Thompson's obviously, I, I think, a better play. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, you've got to be worried about the same thing in both of these aspects, but at least Golden State hasn't played a couple games. Um, my shooting guard, I actually, my, my favorite, um, depending on what happens with the news up top, they, I hate to say it, but I'll do it every single time these two teams play. I'm going back to Andrew Wiggins tonight. I don't hate it at all. I actually think it's a great play. So we're on the same page there. What, this is like the second time all year I've said let's play Andrew Wiggins. And yeah, I think it's like the third for me. Oh man, um, Josh Akogi. I mean, he's gonna. He's going to see a lot of Terrence Ferguson, so I don't think he's going to get the usage or anything. Um, he's cheap, but I don't – he's going to show up in a lot of lineups, but, man, it's it's hard to really yeah. kind of – I mean, he's not going to see the ball enough for him to score a lot. It just – I don't know, man. Like, I need something to happen – to where I feel a lot better about these guys. Now, there is one guy I do have a lot of interest in down low, but I, I'm still not sold on him. He's probably where I'm going as far as value, and that's uh, Daniel Hamilton. Um, going to see 23 minutes, possibly start, even not. He's coming off the bench. He can get hot. He's 3,700. It's, it's not... Well. Here's the thing too. Also, to the throw in there, um, where, where, who, who I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, he just got downgraded. He was probable. Now he's questionable. Oh, if he mi- up. if he misses, that's a massive bump. And uh, you know, I don't know. We'll we'll see who Toronto decides to play tonight. But I, I'm pretty sure they're kind of going to take it easy versus the Hawks. Uh, in terms of workload for their for their studs, and so uh, you know we could see we could see a lot of playing time for that guy. Yeah, I agree with that. So he's probably going to get the bump up a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I hate guards today so much. Like, yeah, it's when it's I'm it's tough, man. At Alec Burks, um, you know. Well, I mean, you should – when Andrew Wiggins is possibly my my number two play overall. That says a lot. It, it says a lot. So <laughs> It says uh, a lot. Uh, also, I don't mind Burks at all. Um, I don't think he sees as much depot, particularly if some of the other guards miss. But um, I don't – I don't hate it. Uh, I, I'll like – we're going to assume that Harris isn't going to play. Uh, as TJ was telling us before, <clears throat> if he had to guess, so that puts you know Monty Morris back into play, it puts Malik Beasley back into play, uh, potentially Tory Craig. So you've got some Denver folks, some Denver guards there that you might look at as well. Um, anybody else here that I like? That's about it, man. Yeah, it's it's a tough day at the guard position today, um, which it. it- <laughs> It could, it should be. So if Booker sits, if Booker sits, I may have some interest in Troy Daniels too. But we'll see how oh, it goes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely going to be be one of those things. Um, 
All right, let's talk about small forwards. We've got uh, we got three big boys up at the top: Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, yeah. Kevin Durant. It's it's George. It's just it's going to be George. Um, I mean, earlier this morning, we are seeing some interesting movement though. Um, last night, Vegas opened this Knicks Golden State game eighteen and a half. Now it's down to seventeen. So they were obviously getting hammered um, for Nick for New York to come. Livingston's out for the Warriors too, by the way. Yeah, Uh, you know Livingston definitely doesn't make a point and a half. So what does that mean? That well, that means a few things. First of all, if it does go, uh, you know, if 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 uh, Golden State covers, that means you're not going to see a full game of Durant. That means you're not going to see a full game of Steph. You're not going to see Clay a full game. You're not going to see Draymond. Um, and since Livingston's not playing, you might look at Quinn Cook for some value. Uh, but as far as this goes, I mean, it's it's going to be George. This game is is going to be close. There's a lot of points being scored in this game. T twenty eight is this total for here. So for me, it's going to be George. And he's the cheapest out of the three, by the way. Yeah, on FanDuel he is. On DK, it's a little bit different of a discussion. Um, he's not the cheapest out of the three. Uh, Kawhi Leonard actually is. But mm. he's gonna he's the guy that has pretty much the highest floor, highest ceiling type of thing. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, Danilo Gallinari against Charlotte Hornets. I love him tonight. I think he's in a good spot. Um, let's talk about these Washington uh, forwards here. Trevor Ariza, Otto Porter Jr., Jeff Green, they're all going to play. Uh, Porter should be up around 30 minutes, and he's criminally underpriced on Fandle, in my opinion. He's Ridiculous. Uh, he was the first thing that um, that I I looked at this morning. Yeah. Yeah, ridiculous. They They didn't, they forgot to price him. I mean, that's just, there's no other explanation. They forgot to price him up. Um, you know, he, he was on a 20-minute limit. It went up to 26, 29 to 30. He's, so he's still going to be coming off the bench. And frankly, I like that for them. It gives their bench some punch that they didn't have. But he's still going to close the game. So, I mean, you know, that's not going to change. But, um I don't. I, he's a lock for me, guys. I'm. So, he just is at that price. I mean, there's just, there's just no way. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Bogdanovich, if these guards miss, uh, I've got some interest there. Um, Justice Winslow in this game, maybe if Gary Harris miss, he's going to see a lot of Wancho. Uh, he's going to see a lot of Jamal Murray. Um, Josh Richardson's kind of <sighs> the same thing. And it's it's kind of a maybe ish type of thing. Um, yeah, they're too expensive for me. Yeah, I, I mean, it really for me, it's it's three guys: it's George, it's Richardson, it's Porter, mm-hmm. and it kind of gets everything kind of at the same aspect. Now, I I do think that uh, Kelly Oubre is in play. Uh, he's thirty eight hundred dollars on Fanduel, and he's going to probably play about twenty five minutes and. If Booker is out, they're going to need somebody to keep the, to score as well. Um, that's where I'll have some interest in Josh Jackson as well, uh, if Booker is confirmed out. But yep, yep. I mean, it, it's just one of those things, guys. It's there's not a lot of lovable plays today um, at those first three positions. So let's move on to power forward here. Uh, Draymond Green actually takes my uh, top power forward spot of the night. Um, the the only question is is can he pay off his price tag? Yeah, before it gets out of hand, it's gonna be tough, man. So I that, that's 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 what the concern is, right? That's what the concern is. The concern is is are we gonna get four quarters of Draymond? I don't I don't know that we will, but I think that's going to be a constant concern now the one good thing i can say about this is that the warriors aren't blowing a lot of teams out lately um now granted they're they're not playing the knicks every night either so but like they just they they're not doing that on a consistent basis 
So I think with guys like Clay and Draymond, those are the two warriors that I want because they're not priced as high. So they don't have to nearly do as much in order to pay off their tags. Yeah. So um, I talked about this a little bit this morning on my roster construction video. I actually like Serge Ibaka better than Pascal Siakam tonight. Uh, one of them, one of one of the reasons why is the price. The second is is really at a shock. Um, over the last twenty games or so. Our ADVP matchup for power forwards, the power forward position on FanDuel, is not good going up against Atlanta. Um, and that's hmm. where Pascal Siakam is. Now, Siakam did just torch these guys like a month ago. So yeah. I don't mind either of them. I think they're, they're priced reasonably fair, and I don't mind them. But with that said, if you give me one, I'm putting in Surge over Pascal Siakam because of the price and because he plays the five, which is, you know, according to our ADVP, a better matchup than the four. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't hate it either. I guess it's, it's another one of those games where I'm just like, how do the Hawks stay close? Trae that's has that's to get hot. It's the only way. Is if him and Jeremy Lin and Deadman just go bonkers. Um, so for me, I got to keep that game to tournament only. Yeah. Um, um, but Tobias Harris. Yeah, he was the next guy I was about to talk about. Ooh. I you know I talked about on the pod this morning uh, or on the show this morning. Um, you know Montrez Harrell being kind of overpriced for the minutes that he's getting, 22, 22, 20. Um, you know, he hasn't gotten over 25 minutes in all but one of his last five games. So, like, yeah. only one of the last five games he's gotten over 25 minutes. Uh, now, granted, he can still blow value out of the water and score 50 points in 23, 24 minutes. But Tobias Harris is... And he's playing 34, 35, 36 minutes a night. And yeah. this is a fantastic matchup for him. Um, and he's he's cheap. Yeah, for his ceiling he is, sure. So. Um, mm, I don't know about the interest in Larry Nance. It's popping right now in the DS, but... I'm not sure I like it. Yeah. Um, that they, Larry Drew seems to want to favor everybody else over Larry Nance. I don't know if Nance's father like kicked Drew in the nuts when they were playing, or I don't know what it happened, but um, uh, uh. It, it just seems like... <laughs> It's so inconsistent. You know, you go from 36 to 21 to 30 to 25. If you follow that trend, yeah, we should see 30 minutes tonight. But I can't. Now, the good thing is, is his price is now below 6K. But I can't yeah. realistically roster him. In it's risky. He's going to get close to 30 minutes. Because you've also got Tristan Thompson back. Uh, so that takes a huge amount away from Nancy's upside and rebounds and you know, just 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 the entire game, because because Thompson's not a shooter, he's all Chris, Tristan's all down low, and so is Nance. Nance isn't a shooter either. I know he's trying to be, but he's he's not. So they pretty much do the same thing. Uh, you know, Tristan just does it at a higher level right now. So, um, yeah, uh, Jerry Jones just bought an outrageous two hundred and fifty million dollars super yacht with not one. But two helipads. That's your team. Okay. Um, yeah, it just popped up on my feed. But um, so yeah, for I mean, I, I think that's that's where Nance took the biggest hit is is Tristan coming back. So he can play thirty minutes, great. But I don't I don't know if I can play him. Yeah, he's more of a tournament kind of option because right about two hundred dollars less is uh, Jeremy Grant. Yeah. Um, obviously, if Miles Turner 
Turner misses, then Sabotis is going to, you know, start popping a little bit more. Uh, let's talk a, let's talk a moment about Dario Sarch. Um, oh, by the way, Marvin Bagley's out, so that actually might uh, bring in Belizia to the conversation in Sacramento. Um, let's talk about Dario Sarch. He's 3,600. I've got him slated for around 27 minutes. Okay. Uh, he's... Right now, he's in every lineup that I make because he's so cheap. And But I don't know why he's slated for 27 minutes considering he hasn't hit that since uh, the Atlanta game. Because Thibodeau is no longer the coach. And so, you know, I think we're... Frankly, it's kind of guessing at this point. Um, we, uh, you know, we need to see. Um, we need to see. Uh, that's what it boils down to. We need to see. Like, I, like I don't know. Um, you know who Saunders is going to play more of, but I don't think Sarge is playing enough. I think Sarge is an, an offensive threat that Taj is not. He's not the defender Taj is, but they they need offense. Uh, they I mean, need score. Anthony Tolliver's been playing more minutes than he has. That's what I'm saying. It just doesn't make any sense. So hopefully that kind of corrects itself, and we're ahead of the ahead of the crowd. Um, just be careful because he's going to pop because of you know the minutes that it's pulling and everything, and taking that in consideration. Be very very careful. I'm willing to take a risk on it and be ahead of the crowd. Uh, I'm just not sure if it's something that I would go, obviously, all in on. Um, yeah. Jonas Derepko, if you think that the Warriors are going to blow out the Knicks, he's going to get some extra burn at the end of the game. Uh, and then Josh Jackson, if, he, if Devin Booker's out, uh, should get extra burn as well. A lot. So, all right, let's talk about the uh, centers here. This actually is the most loaded position. It's not one that I'm going to be um, paying down at. I know a lot of people this morning were talking about Bismack Biombo and Marcin Gortat and, you know, Kavon Looney. Uh, no, sir. I, I'm not taking you that. Can do that. You can do that. You can do that on DK. That's fine. Well, what yeah, on DK, uh, even then I'm finding it very hard to because, I mean, the price for the centers there are so nice that I can go play a Hassan Whiteside and a Draymond Green or I can go play a – uh, a Sabonis at the center position if Miles Turner is out. I can go get a Pascal Siakam for 67, and I can play Serge Ibaka at 64. You know, I can go play a Montrose Harrell at 62, and, um, you know, it's it's so – you can do it, I and I, I wouldn't shock you, but like, I don't think I need to. I mean, Steven Adams is 7K. Um, John Collins is 69. Willie Cauley Stein is sixty three. Um, you know the only the only player that they seem to have priced correctly, uh, you know, is DeAndre Ayton, Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid. Those guys are priced right, but Ayton is more expensive on DK, which is sh this is sh this shocked me today. Ayton's more expensive on DK than he is on um, uh, Fandle. Wow. Yeah, well, he's eighty one on DK, where he is. 78 on Fandle. I mean, they're pricing him based on the matchup versus his recent, you know, game logs. Um, I mean, he's just call it what it is. He hasn't been great in this last handful of games. And it's not all his fault, but um, you know, one of the games they got blown to smithereens and he sat most of the game. Uh, they're down by like 35 or whatever it was. And then they came back and he wasn't part of that comeback and he sat on the bench. Um, but for me, guys, one of the things that I've noticed pretty much all season long, when Booker is not in the game, Aiton struggles. So I don't know if I can play him um, without Booker, but, I mean, he's in play. He's got a great matchup. So, you know, but. Now the we'll question is, him. does that usually happen when both him and Warren are out? Or has it always been with Booker because I know there was a group of, of games where both of them missed and of course the whole team struggled well, yeah well that's the whole team I'm talking about specifically with Aiden like like when Booker is out other guys don't struggle Warren I mean they struggle to compete but they don't struggle individually um, 
when Booker's out, Aiton, because Booker just draws so much. They don't have, not even Warren, man, they don't have anyone on the team that draws defense to them like like Booker does. Um, and it opens up the game for Aiton. Cool. So, yeah, I was just trying to kind of figure out exactly, you know, if that was there. Uh, Steven Adams against, uh, you know, Carl Anthony Towns. I, I don't mind it at all. Guys, Cat is not in play for me tonight, and it has nothing to do with Steven Adams. Uh, he's actually lit Steven Adams up a couple times, but both of those times that he did go for over 60 was in Minnesota. Uh, he has not played well um, in Chesapeake, so I am not going there tonight. It's just not something I'm willing to do. It's Wiggins, and then we'll go from there as far as the, the Timberwolves tonight. But that's a game where I could honestly legit see a game stack uh, without Cat. So, um, are we going? Are we? If if Miles Turner is out, can we go to Tristan Thompson? I'm going to Tristan regardless. Hmm. I'm going to regard. They they forgot to price him up. You're talking about a guy that's playing. He's going to play 30 minutes. Um. At 6,200, this is his third or fourth game back. He's getting his legs back under him. He's going to be at 7K next slate. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, this he's, is – he's going to be – they mispriced him. Of course I'm taking advantage. Yeah, yeah he's uh, – I didn't realize that he hadn't been uh, – hadn't been priced up yet. So I'm trying to find out exactly what his DK price is here. Fifty nine hundred. Okay, yeah, he's in play. Yeah, in a big uh, way. Um, let's talk about the guy that nobody can freaking figure out. Hassan Whiteside. Oh, I had him pegged last game. That's about yeah, the no, only I, time I pegged him this year. <laughs> c- congrats on the one out of you know thirty five, but uh, I, I'm telling you, he's he's hard to peg. Like like it's just I approach my lineups when Miami's on the slate one of two ways: it's Whiteside and no one else from Miami, or it's the rest of Miami and no Whiteside. Like there's like I can't. Like I can't play Bam or Kelly with Whiteside. It doesn't make sense. It's it's either those guys get the run, and Whiteside is frustrated and he you know starts kicking cans and gets mad, or he just comes in and dominates and blocks eight shots and thirteen rebounds and twenty points. I mean, there's no in between. Like he doesn't do decent. He's either horrendous or he wins you a slate. Like there's no di- there's no in between with him. Um, having said that, Denver's been playing a lot of games. Uh, you know, including yesterday uh, versus the Rockets in a really fast-paced, up-tempo game uh, with some a bit of travel into Miami um, from Houston. So uh, I think, and 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 to boot, centers have been putting up big numbers versus Nikola Jokic. So um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's what it is. Yeah, it's uh, definitely somebody I talked about this morning. Um, I think that he's got the potential if he plays 28 minutes to go for 45. Uh, the question is going to be, is he going to play those 28 minutes? Um, and it's something that I'm not for sure about. Um I think he's definitely an option in tournaments, but I don't think that you have to go to him. Um, now, right. on DraftKings, I, I had him pulled up here. Uh, DraftKings, he's in my lineup currently right now because he's 6,600. So, like, I love him on DraftKings. But, yeah. Uh, you know, this, the, that extra $700 uh, difference is, is something that's, that's going to be a little bit it, it's a little tougher to swallow, especially when you only get one. So, um, yeah, man, I, I just 
I, I don't love Thomas Bryant tonight. I see the intrigue in tournaments, possibly, but I don't love it. It's Joel Embiid. It's Willie Colley Stein. I've still got to look into the DeAndre Ayton thing a little bit more just to get the exact numbers um, for sure. But that's a good matchup, at least. Um, as of right now, I don't mind it, but it's it's a fluid thing. Steven Adams in cash, and then Tristan Thompson is probably, you know, I, I think you could also make a case for Dwayne Dedman. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, but I'm not... I'm not going to try to scrape the bottom of the barrel with a Marcin Gortat of Bismack Biombo and hope I guess right. Like between Bismack and, and Willie, I'm not I'm not trying to hope I guess right right on that one. So I mean I guess Kavon yeah. Looney you could take a stab at. Um yeah. but then you're sitting there thinking, well, if they blow him out, then Jordan Bell's gonna get the run. It's just it's true. This is turning it, into a really ugly slate until we get some for sure word on news. We have to get news first. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anything else you want to talk about? Um, I've noticed a trend here where Jan Mahimni is getting a lot more minutes, particularly against opposing, you know, like dominant centers which Embiid is. Um, so something to look at there. I've also noticed Greg Monroe is getting minutes no matter what now in the in the uh, Raptors rotation. Um, so something, something to look at there as well. He's minimum price, obviously, on FanDuel. It's, you know, you don't want to punt center, but um, he's cheap, and he's, you know, can easily get you 20, 25. Not GPP winning, but he can um, and if the game gets out of hand, you might see him some more. So that's about it, though. Hmm. Now you have me intrigued with the Jan Mahinmi thing. And he's definitely in tournaments. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he got 14 minutes against Hassan Whiteside. Uh, he got 24 minutes against Steven Adams. You know, um, 18 against Brooke Lopez. 27 against uh, Andre Drummond. So, yeah, I mean... That could that could definitely be uh, a sneaky sneaky tournament to play. Mm-hmm. So. All righty, guys, that's gonna do it for us today. I want to thank again TJ McBride for joining us, um, beat writer from the Denver Nuggets. I know we went a little bit longer today, but that's the reason why. Uh, and uh, I know that we're still waiting on a ton of news, so it, just make sure that you pay attention to the uh, uh, chats so we can give you all that information. Bear man. Appreciate you. You got it, man. So good pull today. Uh, for myself, for Bear, for the DFS Army, we gone.